thanks, uh, Karen, interviewing Christian and uh, uh, Karina there. Big thank you for that interview. Now, I wonder, what do you think about work? Do you live to work or work to live? Is your attitude to work a bit like David Brent in that that famous TV show, The Office? He said, uh, you grow up, you work half a century, you get a golden handshake, you rest a couple of years, and you're dead. Is that you? To some people, work is a four-letter word. Or maybe you're more like Steve Jobs. He's got a great name for a series on work. Steve Jobs said this, this was his commencement speech for the graduates at Stanford University in 2005. Part of his speech said, sometimes life hits you with a brick. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going when I was fired from Apple was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking, don't settle. Is that you? Are you someone who loves your job? So which is it? Is it something to pay your bills only, or is it something that you love? And of those two views, which is the right view for a Christian to have? Now, as we start this series on work, I need to begin by defining carefully what we mean when we talk about work. This is not just about paid employment. Instead, I'm talking about what God created us to do, what he made us to do. Uh, We read in verse 27 of Genesis 1 that all human beings are created in God's image. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. All of us. Men, women, children too. We all reflect what God is like when we are little creators looking like our God, our Father in heaven, who is the creator, creating like he does. That's the implication of verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, number, fill the earth and subdue it. That is God's first command to humanity. Be fruitful, that is, be productive. Work hard for God's glory. Now, Of course, there was no paid work in the beginning. So this, therefore, today applies to everyone. Even if you're retired or you're unemployed, what is it that you do during the week? For example, children at school may be writing a story for their teacher. They are being creative like their creator. Parents who have children, they are literally putting Genesis 1 into practice. God loves having more children. Not just parents who do that, of course. We join in that role together. Uncles and aunties, grandparents, friends, all helping in the bringing up of children, which is part of God's mandate for the world. Don't think that those roles are somehow less important than paid jobs. Right here we find them in Genesis 1, alongside gardeners and farmers. And verse 31 says of all this, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Very good. That means that work is very good. Being productive and creative in this way reflects God's image, reflects his glory. So when a musician performs a wonderful piece of music, or an artist paints a picture, when a factory worker builds a car, or an accountant does the books, or a cleaner leaves a room spotless, a bus driver gets everybody to work on time, a child builds a space rocket showing all they've learnt, or a grandparent teaches that child how to tie their shoelaces at home. When those things happen, God looks down and says, that is very good. When you do those things, I hope you feel the warmth of God's smile on you as he sees God's children reflecting their creator, acting like their father. So that's the first thing I want us to see this morning, that work is very good. 
It's not a four-letter word. And linked with that, did you notice that in Genesis 1, there is no distinction between the sacred and the secular. God does not talk about two compartments, two categories of jobs, physical jobs and spiritual jobs. There is no compartmentalization in this sense in the Bible at all. It's all work for God, or it should be. And we're going to come back to that in a bit more detail in the second part of my talk this morning. But there's just one more word of introduction, what I'm doing this morning, sort of setting the scene for this series. One more thing to say about what this series is about. It's not just faith at work. It is, of course, specifically a series about faith at work in the middle of a pandemic. And as well as thinking about what the Bible says about work, I hope we can have some time in this series to think about what the Bible says about working in a pandemic under lockdown. And of course, the biggest difference COVID-19 makes to us at the moment is that we're, we're shut in our homes. And so throughout this series, we want to make it really practical, hence uh, the interview that Karen has just had with the Carlescus. Practical help talking through what it looks like in reality serving Jesus at work. Of course, to be fair, Karina does have it a bit harder uh, because she has to live with the extra pressure that her husband is always a Christian at work. Boom, boom. So here is some very simple advice for all of us as we work from home. Uh, this advice came originally from a submarine captain. So, of course, if you're on a submarine, you've got to be, I think it's 87 days underwater, under lockdown. And uh, this captain used to give these five R's. So this was five R's, how to survive in a submarine for 87 days. I give them to you now as five R's, how to cope with working from home under lockdown. Five R's. Number one, routine, routine. Days tend to blur into one, so it's important to add some structure to your life at the moment and keep with clear routines, stick to them throughout the day. A way to help with those routines, number two, is rituals. Have rituals throughout your days. Of course, as Christians, we want to spend a, sort of a set time, maybe reading the Bible and praying your devotions, uh, but also there's rituals like meals. Right now, we, we are still having our Sunday morning services at 11 o'clock each Sunday. We're sticking to that time, like we stuck to 11.15 on Good Friday, to stick to those kind of routines. It gives pattern to your day. So, number one, routine. And number two, rituals. Rituals shape and give meaning to our week. Number three, replenish. That means make sure you get exercise and rest. Routine, ritual, replenish. Number four, retreat. Of course, that's just really hard to do on a submarine. Uh, the submarine captain used to tell his, the sailors on his uh, submarine uh, that when they pulled the curtain across on the bunk, the bunk beds in a submarine, a bit like on a train, you pull a curtain across. He would say, when the curtain is pulled across, the sailor is on retreat. That is private space. So how can you go on retreat in your home? And I say this especially to parents with young children. Are you making sure that your spouse has got that space during the day to retreat as well? It's a way to love one another. Routine, ritual, replenish, retreat, and finally, respect. Under lockdown, tempers are going to fray. It's going to be frustrating. Determined to always respect everyone else at home. Assume the best. Do not assume the worst. So there we go. It's the first section this morning. Work is good. We're made for work. Now, as a church, we want to say a great big thank you to Roger Hawke. Uh, God willing, he's going to celebrate his 80th birthday on Wednesday. So happy birthday in advance to Roger. But as an early birthday present, here is a video now from uh, uh, Alex and Ellie and the boys in Cambodia. And for those who don't know, the Hawke family... Uh, are sent out from this church to tell other people about Jesus in Cambodia. So this is just a short update from them to tell us how they're getting on and telling us how we can pray for them. So over to the Hawks. Okay, so welcome back to Genesis 1. And as some now are getting creative with their wheel of creation, uh, that task, that activity that Karen has set for you, we're now back in Genesis 1. And remember that we saw, first of all, that work is good. Blessed by God, it is good. 
and also the way that the Bible does not compartmentalize jobs. There's no category of, sort of spiritual jobs as opposed to worldly jobs. And I say that because it's absolutely crucial that we get this straight right from the beginning of this series if we're to understand what the Bible says about work. Everything else flows from this. Almost all problems, in my experience, that Christians get into in kind of thinking about work stem from this one misunderstanding of, of maybe unintentionally, but compartmentalizing their life into the sacred and the secular. And what I'm going to do now from Genesis 1 is give you two examples of that. See, first of all, uh, the first really major implication from Genesis 1 is that all jobs are equally good. All jobs are are equally good. Now, I, I suppose I should qualify that slightly. <laughs> I hope it's obvious, but to be really clear, if the way you earn your money is either illegal or immoral, I'm not saying that is good. I'm talking in general, all workers are equally valuable. That's what I mean. It, and I say that because in the past, sadly, the church has sometimes given the impression that sort of spiritual jobs, like maybe being a pastor like me or a missionary like the Alex and Ellie, that somehow those are sort of better jobs, that, that all Christians should really want to do those jobs. And maybe, well, if you can't do those jobs, you sort of settle for second best by doing other jobs. But that's not what it says in Genesis 1 or in Genesis 2 either. How, how often, sadly, have you met at some kind of social gathering or new meeting, have you heard maybe uh, a mum introduce herself apologetically by saying, well, I'm only a housewife? Hardly. Genesis 1.28, be fruitful and increase in number. That, that's the first important job that God gives us. That has great value. This week, Frank Phillips told me a wonderful story that also illustrates this about the time when he and Bernice used to live in Bristol. They were members of a Baptist church there. And this great story happened. Apparently one day, uh, the caretaker for the church was in the church garden, sort of at the front of the church. And I think he was cutting the grass. He was doing something in the garden. And a visitor walked up into the garden of the church and stopped to ask him and said, uh, excuse me, are you the minister and at which point the caretaker looked at him and said, great. this is a great answer, he just looked at him and his reply was, well, I'm one of them. Great answer. Looking after the plants of the earth, there it is in Genesis 1 verse 29. See, look through Genesis 1. Think about that. Doctors and lawyers are not mentioned here. Dentists, hedge fund, hedge fund managers, jobs like that, they come much later. The first two jobs mentioned here are, in effect, a parent and a gardener. It's really important we get this. Uh, those in our church who, who grew up in India and in the South East Asia sort of subcontinent, they know how well, especially if you're Indian, know how well British people like to criticize the caste system in India. And Brits do that, ignoring the fact that there is a very clear caste system in this country. If you uh, are wondering what I mean by that, think for a moment in British culture, what is the first question you are ever asked at any new social gathering? If you're a party, if you're meeting new people at a new meeting, what's the first question we ask each other? Well, after maybe your name, the very first thing we're always asked is, what's your job? What do you do? Because British people, when they hear that, they immediately want to classify you according to your status by your job. Oh, I, I, I'd, I'd never do that, you say. Really? If you're thinking that, just answer yourself. Ask yourself this question honestly. If, due to COVID-19, you were made redundant tomorrow... What jobs would you be willing to do? What jobs would you be willing to do? Would you really be able to do, be willing to do any job and say that it was of equal value? Really? Uh, and equally, we tend to put pastors and missionaries on a pedestal, as if somehow they have, in a Christian sense, those are super jobs and they're better than others. As if Christians can't serve Jesus wholeheartedly as a, maybe a waitress or a footballer. Far from it. 
what we've seen is Genesis 1 does not compartmentalize our lives, and nor should we. Any job, any job can be just as much a spiritual vocation as a physical one. And you can be just as much helping Christ's kingdom as any pastor or missionary. So that's the first thing we need to see. All jobs are equally good. But that's not the only problem we can get into when we tend to compartmentalize our lives. The other thing we need to see here is that all jobs need Jesus to be good. All jobs need Jesus to be good. See, often, we, well, I don't think we do this intentionally all the time, but we split our lives into two groups. So we kind of think, well, on Sundays I worship Jesus, but on Monday, Friday, well, that's going to work. I wouldn't say I worship work, but it almost works a bit like that, as if it's, it's two parts to my life. In the past, the biggest temptation maybe was for Christians to idolize jobs working for the church. Now it's more likely the other way around, that many of us, as you maybe say you work in an office, not during lockdown, but normally say you work into the office, when the door closes behind you, be honest, do you sometimes not sort of think at that point, it's okay, Jesus, I've got this now, I'll take it from here. You, you were doing the Sunday stuff, this is work. This is me doing my job. Increasingly, I hear Christians saying that their job is their ministry. Now, that, that can be a good thing, but sometimes I find when I ask what they mean by that, what they say is, well, I just do my job as well as I can. Now, that is a great goal to have, but my challenge is, is that really the only goal that Christians should be having if they're describing work as their ministry? Is it just doing it in your strength as well as you can? That's not really what the Bible sees as work, is it? No, number one, all jobs are equally good. But number two, all jobs need Jesus to be good. According to the Bible, the only way, I repeat, the only way you can do your job well, as it was meant to be done, is through Jesus. So if at the end of the week you can sit back content with a job well done... And someone asks you, well, how have you done your job well? If you can answer that without referring specifically to Jesus, there's something wrong here. Now, in order to understand this, what we have to do now, really quickly, we haven't got a lot of time, is to do a brief overview of the Bible. I'm going to do this very quickly. So I'd encourage you to reread the passages I'm going to refer to now later so you can see this kind of trajectory of the Bible and be convinced this is really what the Bible says, that jobs can only be good through Jesus. You see, Genesis 1 is foundational to the Bible. And therefore, we keep coming back to it throughout the whole Bible. For example, if you turn to Psalm 8 for a moment, there, Psalm 8, the Psalms is in the middle of the Bible. There, the psalmist gives in verses 4 to, uh, to 8 of Psalm 8, the psalmist gives a basic commentary on Genesis 1, verse 28. It's almost as if the psalmist has got Genesis 1 there. He's reflecting on it, and this is what he says. Psalm 8. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, and all that swim the paths of the sea. See, look, look as the psalmist reads Genesis 1, look at the conclusion he draws. He says, wow! He says, look at human beings. Human beings are amazing. Look at the work that they do. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, men and women are incredible. They're only lower than the angels and God himself. They rule over the whole earth. And that's true, isn't it? Uh, the American Stephen Pinker is right to point out the amazing advances that our, our human civilization has brought. Technology, medicine, even as we speak, Oxford scientists are working on a vaccine for the coronavirus. 
Humans are amazing. The psalmist is right. But not entirely. It's probably more accurate to say that Psalm 8 is right about human beings as an ideal. Reality, if we're honest, falls short. So let's leave Psalm 8 and turn with me now briefly to the New Testament. And this is to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 to 9. Again, hopefully, the passage will appear on the screen as I read it. The writer of the Hebrews says, this is verses 6 to 9 of chapter 2, There is a place where someone has testified, What is mankind that you're mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So there you go. If you're, if you're someone who feels bad about remembering quotes from the Bible, take some comfort that the writer of the Hebrews didn't know where Psalm 8 was either. But if Psalm 8 was a commentary on Genesis 1, then Hebrews 2 is a commentary on Psalm 8. It's a hard look at humanity. Yes, human beings are great, but they are far from what they ought to be. I I didn't really fully understand these verses until I went to live in Australia. You see, growing up in the UK, my my kind of understanding of Psalm 8 uh, was going to my uncle David's farm in Shropshire. I've got images of nice, gentle, rolling hills, uh, my uncle with his dog rounding up the sheep. That is humanity in control as it should be. Instead, you go to Australia, and maybe you go to a beach in Queensland, and you've got to imagine the beach. The beach is idyllic. You know, sapphire blue sea, crystal sea, golden sand. The beach is amazing, but there's nobody on it. Why is there nobody on it? Because there's a sign there that says, warning, saltwater crocodiles. Now, salties can be up to 20 feet long. And on land, they're faster than a human being. And of course, they can swim in in the river or the sea. You can't escape them. I'd like to see a modern-day Adam ruling over one of them. God made Adam. All the 21st century can give us is the Tiger King. No, Stephen Pinker is right about the great advances of humanity, but he does seem to ignore the ways in which human beings are not really crowned with all the glory and honor that Psalm 8 says. In fact, the coronavirus has surely been yet another reminder to us that human beings do not rule the world in this way. The earth is not yet under our feet. We don't control it all. Many ways in which we're on the back foot... So the writer to the Hebrews looks out expecting to see humanity ruling the world as God intended. He expects to see people working in exactly the way God meant, but he does not see that at all. But, but what he does see is Jesus. We do see Jesus is what he says. Isn't that great news? Isn't that wonderful? But if you think about it, what that means is the only way we now, as fallen human beings, the only way we can work fully in the way that God wants us to is through Jesus, because he's the only one in the whole of human history who's ever fully obeyed Genesis 1. It means, therefore, a Christian pupil will stand out at school for the way that they study but for Jesus. A Christian IT consultant will use computers in a way shaped by the gospel. A Christian shopkeeper will trade as Jesus wants them to do. So if one mistake we might make thinking about work is that there's only a few kind of proper Christian jobs like missionaries and pastors, the opposite mistake is to assume that that Jesus doesn't really make much difference to my job. Far from it. When we say that, we are saying we don't need Jesus to do our job. 
Whereas a Christian is someone who says, I cannot do my job, not properly, without Jesus. Now, that doesn't just mean that, you know, we pray at the start of our working day. It doesn't just mean literally, as you shut the door in your office, pray and then that's it. Now, what it means is that my faith in Jesus should impact every second of my working day, everything that I do. Every conversation, every action is all something I do relevant and out of my faith in Jesus. Now, that's what this series is all about. Faith at work. Yes, that is going to be difficult to do. That's going to be a struggle. Which is why we want to help you how to do it and why we want to be really practical week by week thinking through that. All jobs are equally good, but all jobs need Jesus to be good. Now, next Sunday, uh, as the notices have said, we're going to be celebrating the work of CAP, Christians Against Poverty. So that's going to be next Sunday. But then the Sunday after that, we're going to come back and we're going to think more what it means to follow Jesus at work, school, retirement, looking after children, whatever that might mean for you. Uh, So come and join us. As I finish now, just a I haven't gotten them here, they're in my study. I think they're going to appear on the screen. Just a quick plug for two books. Two books you might find really helpful in this series. The first is called Revolutionary Work by William Taylor. So that's a really good book to read. Some of my anecdotes from this talk were nicked from that. Revolutionary Work by William Taylor. And of course, the classic Thank God It's Monday by Mark Green. Two really good books. Revolutionary Work, Thank God It's Monday. See, what we want in this series, we want your story to be one of praising your Saviour all the day long. All the day long, whether that's Sunday or Monday. So we're going to do that now as we sing that great hymn on the organ to Blessed Assurance.